Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be talking about something that bugs us all, <laughs> bugs in software. The first computer bug that was ever recorded was September the 9th, 1947, and that was on the IBM's ASS, uh, ASCC computer, also known as the Harvard Mark I, since it was installed at Harvard University and was conducting uh, mathematical studies for the Manhattan Project. The computer had errors, and when they tracked down the errors, they found a moth uh, in, the, in between the contacts of a relay. It was an electromechanical computer, so the relays, if they could not make contact, well, you had an error. And the art of debugging was to remove the moth from it, and they pasted it to the log sheet for the run that day. <laughs> the, uh, that story, some think that was the first bug ever found. And uh, Grace Hopper, who was a programmer at Harvard on the Mark I, she wasn't there during the incident, but uh, she made the story say, uh, very famous. But was it the first use of the term bug? Uh, as it turns out, no. <laughs> the, the term bug has been an engineering term uh, ever since the mid-1800s. Ada Lovelace, one of the first computer programmers back in 1843, wrote this. Analyzing uh, processes must e equally be performed in order to furnish the analytic engine with the necessary operative data that herein may also lie a possible source of error. Granted, the actual me mechanism is unerring in its process. However, the cards can, can give it the wrong orders. Right. So if you program it incorrectly, it will obey those incorrect orders dutifully. And so, yeah, so she was talking about the first problems with computer software. Thomas Edison wrote in 1878, difficulties arise. This thing gives out, and it is then that bugs, such as little faults and difficulties are called, show themselves. So he was talking about bugs that were creeping into mechanical devices that he was working on at the time. Also, Isaac Asimov uh, wrote about bugs in his book called Catch That Rabbit. Uh, it was a short story published in 1944 that talked about a bug in one of the new robots that they were testing on a mining world, which stopped mining and couldn't explain why. Couldn't recall why it stopped mining. And then, yeah, the book uh, talks about how they how they found out what was going on. But that's a story you should read for yourself. Software Bugs was written about by uh, Stephen McConnell in 2004. He wrote, there. I mean, there's been a lot of books on software engineering and, and bug management that have occurred long before this. But in his book, he found that the industry average for bugs was about 15 to 50 per thousand lines of delivered code. And by the way, if you think that number is great, it isn't. That's terrible. Um, the Yeah, can you imagine, I mean, projects with over a million lines of code, just how many bugs you'd be, you can do the math. I mean, it's huge, the number of bugs that you would have in it. Eric S. Raymond formulated a quote that, that became known as the Linus uh, Law. And of course, it was named for Linus Torvalds. Uh, so he said, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Uh, the actual quote is something along the lines of, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem can be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. Yeah, great idea. It's been the mantra for open source. You have the source out there, therefore more people are going to look at it. Uh, but uh, that has been refuted many, many times. <laughs> Robert Glass refers to the Linus Law as the mantra of open source. He calls it a fallacy due to the lack of evidence and research that has indicated just the opposite. And that is the number of bugs found doesn't scale with the number of people you have reviewing the code. Larry Seltzer suggests that even having the presence of source code may cause some developers and researchers to just 
perform less testing because the source code is out there and they're assuming someone else might find the problem. So why should they do it? Uh, Google's own research of internal project. This one is interesting. I, this one has always fascinated me as to what are the internal mechanics that's going on. But the Google's own research found that internal projects found that the popular projects had 27% more bugs than projects that were unpopular. Uh, the software industry has put an awful lot of effort into reducing bug counts since Stephen McConnell wrote his book. Uh, there have been a number of things that that we that the industry has tried in order to solve it. Code analysis is a is a, a similar kind of thing to uh, to doing uh, code source code reviews, but it's deeper and it and it is used to try to spot potential problems with the code. You know, we have instrumentation that can help us find performance issues or bottlenecks in the system, and testing can find bugs in the parts of the code that's being tested, but of course testing can't cover all the combinations of if-then-else clauses uh, that are in the code. It's just simply not feasible to do that. Uh, testing automation software can certainly speed up the process. It can improve on it somewhat because uh, the, the automation can include tests to try to get to the if-then clauses if the testing uh, director who's helping to develop those that test automation knows what they are and what the values are or the margins to be able to give the code to get it to execute that software. And generally, it's not really well done, at least not in my not in my experience. I I know that we tried some testing automation uh, on our project, the last one I worked on. It. Yeah, it helped, but it wasn't enough to justify the cost of developing the test routine. So, yeah, that's the other problem you have is you're adding cost to your development cycle. But is it worthwhile? Sure, absolutely it is. I mean, if if you're it, you don't if you're in a, a life if you have software that's being delivered to hospitals or to uh, airports or to aircraft or things that you know, you don't want software failures in nuclear reactors would be another one where you don't want, I mean, it's not desirable to have any kind of bugs in those situations. Uh, people could die. Um, yeah. So you don't, yeah, you definitely don't want to do that. So is it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it in those cases, but you have to weigh it against what you're actually doing with it. There's also defensive programming and programming style uh, that can help reduce the number of logic errors or at least find surface them so that they can be brought to the attention of the code review team to look at it on the spot. So it helps them spot it a little easier. Agile development was brought about to hopefully help reduce uh, the amount of code that was changing by increasing the frequency of those releases. So it's the write a little, test a little, release a little uh, philosophy. However, I remember when I, I remember a couple of times back in the past where Second Life, for example, implemented agile development back, I think it was in the 2007, I think. Uh, and they ran it as, you know, every on a weekly update, they were adding new features to their code weekly. And they were doing it in the agile method. But they forgot about the bugs that the code was injecting into the system over time. Nobody went back and fixed them. And so they, their backlog of problems and issues grew into the tens of thousands. And I remember looking at the, uh, at the, the you can go out and look at their bug database today. It's still there. And you'll, see, you'll see bugs that are still in there that have not been closed since 2007. So... Yeah, it just overwhelms the development, and you can't fix that. So, and you can get stacking of bugs that happens too uh, over time. In, in that, you know, somebody will rediscover the same bug, or they'll fix it, and then somebody will merge code that has the bug in it, and here you go again. It resurfaces the bug again. We've, we've seen that many times with other pieces of software. I'm not picking on just Second Life. It's just that their example really brought it home for me because I remember when that happened. So. Uh, some programming languages deliberately remove features designed to reduce bugs, making them more likely to occur, which is just, huh? <laughs> Why would you do that? Some programming languages introduce new features that they think are going to help the program development and make things easier, like 
C thought Malik was a good idea, and later on we found out, no, that is not a good idea, uh, because Malik, if you're if you don't de Malik in the same uh, section of code where you did the Malik, you end up with a memory leak, and that <laughs> yeah that became a real issue. Uh, in fact, that's the reason why Rust exists today is that people don't want that kind of functionality anymore. Then we have, okay, so I have this, 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 this list of bugs. Now I have a process that I have to follow in order to, let's say that a user submits a problem report and it goes into the system as unconfirmed because no one has tested to see if it can be reproduced or not. If it can be reproduced great, then you move on to the next step. But if not, what do you do with it? Do you leave it in the open state? There's a lot of pressure that, you know, you've got open issues here that haven't been closed. Those can count against your project and your managers generally will look at that and say, what are you doing about that? So uh, sometimes if there's only a single occurrence of the issue, they may close it and it's going to come back. Uh, In my experience, it always comes back. So yeah, that short idea, that short thinking idea doesn't necessarily help you. So debugging is a bit of an art. And and bugs, I mean, even if you have a bug that occurs and is reported in one part of the system, say it's uh, maybe it's a, uh, a, a storage uh, device that can't save and it, and it throws an error because the data isn't in a format that the driver understands, you could track that all the way back up. Even I've seen that be tracked all the way back up to a graphics card, a bug in the firmware of a graphics card causing it. So just because it gets seen in one part of the system doesn't mean that the bug actually exists there. And that can make debugging very tricky to find. Uh, also, they can be, uh, they, they, believe it or not, software bugs can be intermittent. Uh, they could be data sensitive. So if as long as everything is great and the data is fine, you never have a problem. But the minute the data changes just a little bit, boom, it blows up. So a fault uh, can appear to be totally unrelated to the section of code that the fault occurred in. And I remember a problem that we had. This was back when I was working for Burroughs. We had a problem at a, uh, it was a bank service bureau. And every midnight, the, the system would crash. So we were like, what's going on? Why midnight? I mean, it wouldn't always be right at the clock midnight. So it wasn't like, oh, it's something to do with the clock going over that we've got some kind of code that, that's in there looking at the clock and it's then it's got an error in it, right? Sometimes it was before midnight. Sometimes it was after. A couple of times it happened an hour after midnight. So it didn't really make much sense to us. We couldn't find a pattern in when it was occurring. We looked at everything, and we could not we could not find a problem at all with it. So <laughs> it was just we were baffled. We had no idea. So one of the engineers said, hey, I got an idea. Well, let's just put a closed-circuit camera in. Let's just see what's going on and put it on the drive so that we can see. It was a drive that was going down, so let's just put it on the drive and let's see what it's doing. And, uh, yeah, next morning we review the footage, and we see that night operator walking over to the drive and kicking it. Yeah. <laughs> then the fault occurred. So, yeah, I, I'm sure the company dealt with the problem. But, yeah, I, I mean, that was that was something totally unexpected, right? We just didn't expect to see that. Sometimes programs can run for years before encountering a problem. We've seen that in OpenSSL. We've seen that uh, in a number of open source pieces of software where the bug has been laid dormant for a while and then all of a sudden, boom, there's a vulnerability that's found in that particular part of the code. So some of them can be caused, I mean, some of those old bugs can surface when there's an operating system upgrade that may change the behavior of the data stream a little bit, and all of a sudden a bug shows up in downstream software. Also, libraries can do that too. Some of the data... Uh, which is coming in that the program doesn't understand or doesn't isn't hasn't got any code that can handle it may drop through to an air condition and branch off and stop. So, yeah, I mean those kinds of things can happen. So some because the program had never had a, had to run a section of code before uh, contained a bug. You see that all the time in banking software. They at the end of the year would close their books and so they would close their 
their uh, general ledgers at, on the last day of the year as required by law. And that code had never run all year. And the banking regs each year had to be included in even in the general ledger system. So they always had changed. I don't know how many times all of us got called out at 3 in the morning to go fix a problem on a system where the general ledger blew up because it had never been run before. And obviously not well tested. To, to try to help researchers understand bugs better, there are actually benchmarks that exist that will inject bugs into your system uh, and, and create havoc and so that you can try to figure out how better you can manage them, how to, how to make your systems more fault tolerant and resistant to them. Uh, Siemens has such a benchmark. There's one called MIDI Bugs, which is written for C programs. Uh, there's Defects for J, that's for written for Java. There's Bears, which is a benchmark for continuous integration. It focuses on build failures in the code base. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different things that can be done with it. But how well have we actually done? During the space shuttle missions, NASA actually achieved zero defects for 500, per 500,000 lines of code. So a phenomenal amount of... of of work and cost went into doing that. But can every business afford to, to do that kind of coding? So yeah, I mean, those, that's very, those are some very strict rules. So what I decided to do was go take a look at the Linux kernel because like others, I have been noticing that there seems to be this backlog of bugs that are being worked on from previous old versions of Linux. And it's like, Huh? Well, I mean, if you go out and look at the, the bug database for Linux, you can see that, you know, they report, let's say, let's, let's just pick a number, 1,500 uh, a year, right, uh, per release. Let's say it's around 1,500. And then you'll see that they're working, there's a backlog of 5,000 bugs. You're like, huh? I mean, wh how, where did those come from? Well, they're, they're stacking. That's what happens is that they haven't gotten to those, and those are stacked up from older releases of the code. So Linux has about 26 million, let's just say 400,000 lines of code, something like that. That's, that's according to Tokii, which I ran against the, the 6.1 source code base. So trying to get an accurate count of bugs found in a given release of Linux honestly is like looking for a needle in a haystack the way that they the way that they track bugs and the way that they label which release it goes into is very confusing and so yeah so right bugs reported in older releases are being fixed in newer releases is what we have found uh, Jonathan Corbett, uh, Corbet, back in December of 2022, observed that Linux seems to level out at around 1,200 to 1,500 bugs per release. So we can use that as a basis for calculating what the error rate is on Linux to be somewhere around uh, 0, uh, 0.05 to 0 0.06 per 1,000 lines of code. Uh, and if you do the math on it, that's still a lot of, of bugs uh, that are in there. And, and I'll put a link into the LWN article if you're interested in reading more about that. Uh, NetBSD has about 42 million lines of code. Uh, about four, it's about 42 million and a half, somewhere around in there. So according to Tokii, they use a database called NAT, and they've used that database for quite a while. Uh, it's, but they, it has a total of 54,000 bugs in it since they began using it. Uh, I, yeah, I think it goes back about 30 years or so. So it goes almost all the way back to the beginning of when they first started tracking bugs. They average according to, uh, their database and their database is very well organized. Uh, and, and, and you know, that kind of fits with, I mean, I don't mean, I don't, I don't mean this as, uh, trying to, to point fingers at Linux being bad because Linux isn't. But it just points to the, it's, uh, those people have been doing it longer. They, under, I mean, they, they understand, they take their time. They don't rush to try to get something out the door every two months. So yeah, they're a little bit slower in their release cycles. And so they take a little bit more care in testing. 
about 1,800 bugs per year or so is what you usually see in them. So that gives them a, a, K lock, a, a, a bugs per K lock at around 0 0.042. So and I'll put their 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 stats up here as well. Minix, um, Minix reports that you know I, I've seen some of the lectures by uh, Andrew Tannenbaum who said you know they're really trying hard to reduce the amount of discovered bugs after a release, and that's great. Um, their their code base is today around seven point six million lines of code or so. Uh, according to Tokyo and GitHub, which is their issue tracker, reports about 77 open issues and about 104 closed for Minix 3.3. I'm calculating that that means that they have about a 0 0.02 uh, bugs per uh, thousand lines of code. So I did notice that there's a couple of issues in there that were really questions. So subtracting those out didn't didn't appreciably change the score. But if you look at if you look at software versus hardware, so hardware can survive a failure, right? We have RAID that I mean, if the drive fails, if it crashes, uh, I have RAID, I, I have ZFS that I could use in order to compensate for that failure. The system will continue to operate until it reaches the maximum number of drives that can fail before if a total failure on the storage system occurs. I also have uh, error correcting memory, ECC memory that can detect single bit errors and it can keep going, it'll correct those errors. Uh, and I also, have, uh, I also have TCP IP which can request a retransmission of a message that contains an error. I have the ability to install multiple LAN cards with multiple routes that, are, that in the event that a route, an entire path goes down that I can continue to operate. I have multiple power supplies in most of the servers that can survive a power failure on one side while, and the machine can continue to operate. Uh, there's also virtualization that can restart an application on a completely different uh, system, it has to freeze it for a moment and transfer it over to a new machine and then start it up in the same state. Or it might be a it might be a case where you have a hot standby where it just switches automatically and there's you don't even skip a beat. There's also the same kind of thing for container management, yeah, and all that. But you can also do regional hot backups where uh, if a, if you have a natural disaster that occurs in a in a data center on one coast or the other, or at one facility or at another, you can automatically transfer the load over to the other hot site without skipping a beat. So if we have those kinds of things for hardware, why can't we do the same kinds of things for software? So that's where I'm going to leave it, but I'm going to leave this quote for you from one of the early programmed uh, computer pioneers by the name of Maurice Wilkes. He, he, he made a quote, this was back in the 40s, where he said that he came to the realization that much of the rest of his life is going to be spent finding the mistakes in the in his code that he had written. So, so he kind of saw himself being consigned to something he did not sign up for, uh, is that he didn't want to be responsible for all those bugs that he created. <laughs> and we all are in that same boat with Maurice. So on that, I'm going to leave you today. I uh, I hope you enjoyed this look at why we have bugs in software. We're, you know, I think it's improved, right? I, th I think things have improved, but when you scale up to millions and millions of lines of code, it looks bad. It looks worse than it actually is. But as long as we can continue to shrink the number of reported issues per thousand lines of code, or maybe a million lines of code, uh, then we're on the right track and we're doing the right things. I still think that software could do a better job that it is doing, and I and I, I mean, tools like what NASA was using are insane. They're absolutely insane what they have to go through in order to get uh, a, that code approved to get into a runtime. So, yeah, I mean, that cost is just very expensive. Uh, that's probably not going to be the answer, but it, maybe it, maybe there are parts of that that can be used. So with that, that's all I had. Hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now.